Now, I'd like us to turn to our passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, as you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, I want us to think about the truth. I think we'd all agree that it's a noble thing to uphold the truth and to expose falsehood. And if you think about it, even people outside of the church are quite, uh, they are convinced to a certain extent that it's necessary to uphold the truth and to expose falsehood. Now, people who do not know the Lord might not be necessarily right about what they believe to be true. They might not have a consistent worldview. They may contradict themselves or the issues that they address might not even have much value. But I think it's safe to say that generally speaking, even in a post-truth world, people think that it's good to uphold the truth, and even to expose falsehood. It's a noble thing in people's minds, and it's evidenced by people, let's say, calling out fake news, right? We see that, that's not real, that's fake news, that's bad. We see people uh, filming documentary after documentary to show the true story behind some controversial event. You know, there's uh, people who uh, talk about the conspiracy theories, but their main issue is that, well, people have been lying to us. We want the truth to come out. A Jeffrey Epstein documentary has rolled out on Netflix. We want the truth to come out. But of all people in the world, there's only one group of people, there's only one group of people that have been charged to uphold the truth of God. The truth of God and His Word, and that is the church. Well, that is the household of God. So let's read 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, our passage is verse 14 to 16, but I would like to read from verse 1 of chapter 3. This is the word of the living God. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if, he, if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified. Not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth." Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Let's pray. Our Father, please help us not only to understand what you are saying in this chapter, but to believe what you are saying in this chapter. 
and to believe that what you're saying in this chapter must be true of us. In Jesus' name, amen. There's no point of setting forth Christian truth apart from or outside of the context of Christ, Christ himself. You can see a lot of um, political commentators who are conservative in their leanings, and they will say lots of true things that will make Christians say amen about, um, about abortion and about gay marriage and about all of these cultural issues, and you love them and you even repost them on your social media. Many of these men, though, have no taste for Christ. Many of these men don't believe even in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. For Christians, truth, biblical truth or truth in general, just as a true concept, can never be outside of the context of the truth, Christ. And on top of that, as we learn here, our theology should never be divorced from our ecclesiology. That's the doctrine of the church, ecclesiology. So it's no surprise that our passage, verse 14 to 16, comes right after Paul's list of qualifications for church leaders. What is a biblical elder? What is a biblical deacon? Paul tells Timothy, hey, Timothy, instruct this congregation of yours in Ephesus concerning how they should behave themselves in the church. And then Paul gives Timothy a confession of faith regarding Christ, who is the head of the church. And this is because the church is the household of God. And we, as the household of God, must uphold the truth. And we do this primarily in two ways. Firstly, through the church's conduct. And secondly, through the church's confession. Now, you have to keep in mind, this is not necessarily a, a, a chronological sequence. It's not like we, we have to live out the truth first, and then we come to know the truth and proclaim the truth. That, that's impossible. In fact, the biblical pattern is the opposite. The biblical pattern is that orthodoxy, right thinking, must come first. Right thinking, right believing. Then that leads to orthopraxy, or right living, correct practice. It just so happens that we have decided, I have decided, to jump smack in the middle of First Timothy chapter 3. Starting next week, by the way, I'm beginning in chapter 1, verse 1. Take this as a strange way of introducing the book of First Timothy by jumping right into the middle of it, where I believe there are some key verses. Now, if you flip back to First Timothy chapter 1, you read Paul's words and his concern for sound doctrine in verse 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. This is Paul's concern. He's writing so that uh, Timothy could actually call out some specific people. He's concerned for doctrine. You know, for many Christians today, especially I, I can speak for young Christians in this age of the internet where there's so many resources. I mean, this is funny. We all come from different places, even different countries, right? But when we got to know each other, we were listening to the same preachers. We had the same favorite theologians and all of that. So it's a strange age that we live in where internationally that can happen. But let me tell you, for many young Christians who get into that through the internet, one of the first doctrinal issues that they end up diving into when they really get into theology, what's one of the first doctrinal issues? Soteriology, the doctrines of grace, the doctrine of salvation, or the five points, as they would say. And it's, it's a good thing. That's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. Uh, the return to a biblical understanding of God's sovereignty and salvation should be celebrated. It's a great and wonderful thing. It's one of the things that unites us as well. We believe in the sovereignty of God in salvation. But many soon realize that's not enough. Five points, not enough. Understanding that God chose you, you did not choose God. Great, 
biblical, not enough. There was an article written not so long ago by a man named Owen Strachan. I, I like him. He's a good writer. And it's called Reformation Doctrine Fuels Reformation Ecclesiology. I think this is an appropriate way to begin our time together worshiping as a congregation. I'm going to quote from it at length. It's good. That's why I want to do that. Please listen. Quote, Congregations that begin taking the Bible seriously on the doctrine of salvation can hardly help but take the Bible seriously on the doctrine of the church. The two cannot be separated. The spirit who saves the individual through union with Christ is the spirit who brings that individual into union with the blood-bought people of God. We're not saved into isolation. We're saved into a family. A collection of strangers and pilgrims rescued from the world and brought into the household of God, our Father and Protector. As pastors realized the Bible spoke powerfully to the sovereignty of God and redemption, they also realized that the Bible presented itself as the very food of the people of God. This sparked a rediscovery of the pastoral office. The pastor was not revivalist in chief, though he must intentionally address unbelievers in his sermons and unstintingly call them to repentance and faith in Christ, he now saw himself as fundamentally responsible to lend strength to the body of believers given him by Almighty God. He must teach them all things, bringing the whole counsel of God to bear on their minds, their affections, and their wills. What a sea change this was, Strachan writes. This new model of ministry was actually old, very old. Doctrine was not for the cranky intellectual types who liked parsing hard to read books in the church basement. Doctrine was the very lifeblood of the church. Doctrine, by which we simply mean biblical truth in collated and synthesized form, fed the people, blessed the people, guarded the people, and readied the people to meet their maker. The pastor, it turned out, was not a life coach, a CEO, an administrator, a therapist, a heart-on-his-sleeve storyteller. The pastor was a theologian, and he was called to minister sound doctrine in the hospital room, in the marriage counseling room, in the youth group, in a lunchtime Bible study, in an evangelistic encounter, and yes, suprema gloria in the pulpit. Close quote. So, brothers and sisters, this is what is to happen in the household of God. Hold me to that as I seek to proclaim the word to you faithfully, that we must know the truth and proclaim the truth. We don't just preach it to the outside world, but also inside the church that we would believe and behave according to the truth. So here's that first thing, the church's conduct. The first couple of verses, 14 and 15, Paul gives instructions to Timothy on how Christians are to behave in the household of God. Verse 14, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. So here's young pastor Timothy, pastoring in Ephesus. Paul is writing, Paul is planning to visit, but in case Paul delayed, in case he didn't make it, he wrote this so that at least Timothy would know his pastoral duties. And it also seems that he wanted the Ephesians to know how to support their pastor by behaving properly. I mean, that's one of the greatest things that a congregation can do for their leaders, right? By actually acting right. And in this letter, what does acting right look like? Well, we see chapter 1, proper doctrine. We see chapter 2, proper gender relations in family and church. We see in chapter 3 also, proper spiritual leadership. Now, before we get to how we actually behave in the church, I want to ask you, why is that so important anyway? That we behave in a way, in a certain way, in the household of God. What is it about the church that makes our conduct 
so important. Well, look at those descriptions in verse 15. Household of God, church of the living God, pillar and buttress of truth. Wow, what great descriptions. That's supposed to be who we are. So let's look at those descriptions. Household, that, that comes up a lot in the New Testament. And we see there was a type of household, even in the Old Testament, that pointed us to a greater household, which is the people of God as a whole, Jew and Gentile in the New. We, members of the household of God, are children of God. We have the same father, and we've been born again into this new household by faith in Jesus. We've been engrafted in by the Holy Spirit. So here we are in this household, brothers and sisters, different roles, different responsibilities, but we're still one because we have one father. And we, the children, get this, carry the name of the father. Everywhere we go, we carry our father's name, just like you carry your father's last name. We carry the father's name. And this household, therefore, has supreme importance because this household carries the name of God. And we're also called the church of the living God. John Calvin comments, there are good reasons why God should call the church his house. For not only has he received us as his sons by the grace of adoption, but he himself dwells in the midst of us. That's why this is the house of God, the church of the living God. And if this letter was sent before the letter to the Ephesians, uh, sorry, if the, Ephi if the letter to the Ephesians was sent before this letter, and I, I happen to believe so, then upon reading this letter, the hearers in Ephesus would have been reminded of the book of Ephesians. Chapter 2, verse 22, In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And then we're called a pillar and buttress of the truth. A pillar. Think of that image, a pillar holding something up, holding a roof up. There's many ways that that's used in the New Testament. Uh, it's used metaphorically to describe the pillars of the church, James, Peter, John, Galatians 2.9. But here, Paul is using this word to drive home the importance of proper conduct in the church by calling it a pillar and buttress of the truth. A pillar holds up something. And in this case, it is the truth. It is the testimony of God. And a buttress is a supporting structure. You know what a buttress is? You might see it in old structures. You'll have a wall, and you'll have something like this on the wall holding it up. And what that means is if somebody attacks from the outside, the buttress will hold the structure up. It's also there for defense. It provides support and protection. And it is in this sense that we, the church, should uphold the truth. I want to mention that this is a distinctly Protestant view. The Roman Catholic Church uses that very phrase, that verse, to claim that the church herself is the foundation of truth. Okay, think about it. They use that to claim that the church herself is the source of truth and therefore sola scriptura is false. They believe that church tradition can actually set forth truth that is not necessarily in scripture. But that is not, think about it, how a pillar and a buttress works. A pillar upholds something important. A structure protects and strengthens something important. We are not the source of truth. But as Paul says in Ephesians 2.20, we are members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself, the cornerstone. So the church is not the source or foundation. She is built on the true foundation, which is God's word. God's revelation, that is, the Old Testament prophets' writings, the New Testament apostles' writings, the Word of God, and ultimately the Word become flesh, Jesus Christ. We don't create truth, we don't remake truth, we don't add truth, we don't subtract truth, we simply uphold 
the truth. That's it. That's our role. It's already there. It's been given. We hold it up high for all to see. So as children of God, members of the household of God, living in the presence of God, you must be people of truth, people of integrity, people who care about the truth. And what we do with the truth is also vital. We are charged to lift it up and have every man who has eyes see and every man who has ears hear this precious truth. That is why the church's conduct, how we actually live, matters. That also communicates and strengthens the truth, upholds it for people to see. Now, listen again to Paul in verse 15. He wants Timothy and the church to know how one ought to behave in the household of God. This, I believe, is 1 Timothy's key verse. I want you to know how one ought to behave in the household of God. Sound ecclesiology, godly conduct, is a means by which the truth is held up high by the church. And the word ought means that this exhortation is binding. You ought. It is necessary. This behavior is proper. We ought to live a certain way. That is, we ought to live and conduct ourselves in a way that is consistent with being the fortress of truth. So this whole book is a call to outstanding, above and beyond conduct for those who call themselves Christians. A call to holy behavior, a call to continuous prayer, a call to modesty, a call to biblical church order and leadership. So may the Lord challenge every single one of us as we study this book to conduct ourselves in a way that is consistent with what we are called. Household of God, church of the living God, pillar and buttress of truth. Yet let us never forget that the church's conduct is supposed to be rooted in the church's confession. All the imperatives which God gives the Christian always flow out of the indicatives of the gospel. In other words, what we do must always flow out of what God has done. Kevin DeYoung puts it this way, the secret of the gospel is that we actually do more when we hear less about all that we need to do for God and hear more about all that God has already done for us. That's gospel motivation. That's grace motivation. So the church's conduct must be rooted in our last and second point, the church's confession. In this one climactic verse, Paul summarizes for Timothy the gospel the person and work of Christ. Verse 16, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. What is this confession? He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. What a great confession of faith. Here's a great example of upholding the truth and fighting falsehood. I mean, I want you to see how smart or how winsome Paul is being here, okay? This is Ephesus that he, you know, that, that Timothy is pastoring. Back in Acts chapter 9, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 19, when Paul was in Ephesus, he observed lots of stuff going on. Remember when he was preaching and then the silversmiths started a riot because of his preaching? A whole bunch of them rioted, in a, and they were crying out for hours, a chant. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians for hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. It's against that pagan, idolatrous backdrop that Paul now writes, and he is exclaiming, Great indeed! is the mystery of godliness. He speaks their language, and then he proclaims that that mystery is Christ. 
That's who you should be talking about. That's who you should be chanting. That's who you should be screaming about. The mystery of God. It is a mystery in the New Testament especially. It's something that was previously concealed. Now it has been revealed. And what is that mystery of godliness? It sounds like something that even the Greeks would be interested in. Mm, mystery of godliness. Well, it's Christ. We learn that the church's conduct is directly tied to this great mystery, and his name is Jesus. Godliness, godly conduct flows out of our confession, and that is Christ. So in order to present Christ to us, he writes what, what appears to be an early hymn or, or, or creed you know, guys, it's quite possible that this is something that the early Christians were already singing, or even a catechism of some sorts that was already in use in the local churches. You see, we have always been, from the first century onwards, a confessing church. We proclaim and declare what we believe. This word, confess, simply means to assert something openly, to declare something without reservation, we confess the Christ, the truth, and in doing so, we deny falsehood. We demolish false assertions and wannabe messiahs. When it comes to Christ and what we believe about Him, as Dr. Steve Lawson says, we're not just dogmatic, we're bulldogmatic. There's no give. There's no give whatsoever. It just is. That's what we believe, especially when it comes to the gospel. So look at this beautiful confession. It seems to neatly fit in three pairs. I believe it was Kent Hughes, great preacher, that I once heard observe this well. Christ revealed, Christ witnessed, and then Christ received. Christ revealed. The first pair. He was manifested in the flesh, then vindicated in the spirit. You see that? Manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit. S -s Clearly, manifested in the flesh speaks of the incarnation. God became man. He really did come. Colossians 2, 9, for in him the whole fullness of deity bodily dwells. From the get-go, this is how a good confession of faith should be. From the get-go, all kinds of heresies have just been denounced by that statement. You can't be a Christian without that statement, without a biblical understanding that God in Christ became flesh. There's no other Christ but the one who is the eternal Son of God begotten and who is God and man, for he is the only mediator. And then it says vindicated by the Spirit. What do you think that speaks of? Well, that is actually referring to Christ's resurrection. The word vindicated here also can mean justified, but it's not meaning justified as in declared righteous because he was a sinner, because Christ was not a sinner. We're talking about a Romans chapter 1 verse 4 kind of thing. Christ was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. He was in that sense declared, vindicated. If there were any doubts in the watching world of who he was, they can't doubt now, for he rose from the, the grave, vindicated by the Spirit. So, household of God, this is a kind of uh, uncompromising, clear, doctrinal confession that helps us uphold the truth. Christ revealed, and then now we read about Christ witnessed. So yes, he came in the flesh. Yes, he rose from the grave. And then it says these two statements, this next couple. Seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations. Seen by angels, and then proclaimed among the nations. Think about the angels. Isn't it interesting that in really important redemptive acts in the life of Jesus, angels were there? They seemed to be the witnesses of everything that Christ did redemptively. They foretold Mary's birth. They sang when he was born. They ministered to him after he overcame Satan's temptation. They were there at his resurrection. They appeared at his ascension. And they surround him now, constantly praising him. Angels. 
can attest to the glorious redemptive work of Christ. But I, I love the next statement proclaimed among the nations. Because the knowledge of Christ's work was not reserved for the angelic realm alone. He was proclaimed among the nations, both Jew and Gentile. How great is it that proclamation, that is preaching, is mentioned alongside Christ's redemptive works. We see how vital it is to preach Christ, the necessity of proclaiming Christ. It is the primary means which God uses to make Christ known all over the globe. Heaven above and earth below has witnessed the power and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, either by witnessing it firsthand when Jesus came, died, resurrected, or even by having it proclaimed to them. Christ revealed, Christ witnessed, and lastly, Christ received. Here's the last couple. Believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Yes, it is true that he was rejected by the multitudes. That's very true. But at the same time, he was also received by many. Many whom the Lord drew to himself. He was believed on in the world, and that's still happening today. And also, he was taken up in glory. He was received by people who believed upon him as Lord, and he was received into heaven as well. And he is now seated on the right hand of God the Father, ever interceding for his people. Listen to the author's own testimony of how he also received Christ. Chapter 1, verse 15, Paul says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display His perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. We confess that He was revealed by His incarnation and His resurrection. He was witnessed by angels and by the nations, and He was received in earth and in heaven. Household of God, is this your confession? Is this the Christ that you confess? Is it the Christ that has been believed in the early church, all the way down to the medieval church, all the way down to the Reformation church, and all the way down to the 21st century? Not some new idea, some innovation of Christ, but the old Christ, the Christ who always was. We're talking about the one who is the eternally begotten Son of God who came in the flesh and lived a perfectly righteous life, who was sentenced to death under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified and died and was buried and on the third day rose again and ascended into heaven, ever interceding for His believing ones, and who shall return once more to judge the living and the dead. That's the Christ. He's always been the Christ, and we must confess this Christ. Household of God, church of the living God, pillar and buttress of truth, know who you are as purchased by the precious blood of Christ and then conduct yourselves accordingly. Let's seek to do that together. And let's seek to hold fast to our confession. Let's have no give when it comes to what we believe about Christ. And may the world see that truly, the household of God upholds the truth. And may we lift up Christ for all to see. Pray with me. Our gracious Father, who is in heaven, your name is holy, and you deserve our reverential awe and fear. And we thank you today that you have given us your word. You've been so gracious to give us 1 Timothy. And it was already 
overly gracious of you to even give us just 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for revelation. Thank you that through the word you are communicating yourself to you are not just communicating to us O God you're not just saying things to us O God but you are communicating yourself to us we are knowing you through this and we thank you that you have done this please help us to have that proper conduct and confession which only you can give us in your word. Lord, may our lives in this new little congregation be a testimony of your truth, the truth, our Lord Jesus Christ. Humble us, please. Reveal to us our sin. Show us the many ways that we are not upholding the truth, both in word and in deed. And break us, O God, that we might not come home with our families this Lord's day and not be moved, not be prompted to evaluate our words and our deeds in light of the truth. Sanctify us by that truth. In Jesus' name, amen.